Welcome to the 700 Club. The jab or your job, that's what some 84 million Americans are facing because of the Biden administration's new vaccine mandate. After more than two months, the rules for the mandate have finally been released. More than two dozen states are pushing back, and millions of employees say they'll lose their jobs rather than take the shot. So what comes next? Here's Jenna Browder with the latest. This new mandate from the Biden administration affects some 84 million Americans who have until January 4th to get the shot. Already swift pushback from lawmakers, businesses and others who are taking legal action. After weeks of protest against local vaccine mandates, now a new federal deadline for two-thirds of American workers. The Biden administration mandating medium-sized and bigger businesses require workers to get vaccinated or face weekly testing. The new rule also includes 17 million health care workers in nursing homes, hospitals and other locations that receive money from Medicare and Medicaid. They do not have the option of testing and have to get the shot. Violators face a $14,000 fine. At a hearing on Capitol Hill, Dr. Anthony Fauci defending the move. We know that vaccines absolutely save lives. And we know that mandates work. States are pushing back, more than two dozen taking legal action. From the very beginning, I've told President Biden that I would defend the freedom of the people of South Dakota and that if he took this action, that we would see him in court. But today I'm announcing to you that we are joining several other states in filing litigation against this unconstitutional mandate. People should not be in a situation where they're faced with the jab or their jobs. And several business groups expressing concern and arguing the mandate will burden them during the busy holiday season. The mandate also reportedly does not include a carve out for truck drivers, sparking concern for an already hurting supply chain that's helped to feed inflation. There are 80,000 truck drivers uh, that are not on the job as we speak. That's up from 60,000 just a couple of weeks ago. This is getting worse, worse and worse. Add to that a recent survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation that shows 37 percent of unvaccinated workers say they would leave if their employer required them to get vaccinated or be regularly tested. So what are opponents specifically challenging? Some point out that while the mandate is supposed to be an emergency rule, it doesn't take effect until January, about four months after the president announced it. So they question how the regulation can be called an emergency. Opponents also note that COVID-19 cases have declined from a recent wave in September. And some, like Governor Ron DeSantis, argue this is government by bureaucracy and inconsistent with the Constitution. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, our CBN News medical reporter, Lori Johnson, is with us. And so, Lori, I've got to ask, what, in the rules, how is this going to be enforced? I'm hearing $14,000 as a penalty for one violation. And I assume that OSHA can come in and find multiple violations. Are our businesses going to go out of business because of this? Well, with the most interesting thing about it, Gordon, is there are only 1,200 OSHA employees who are tasked with enforcing this. And these millions of people and these thousands of companies, there's no way they can check every single company. So what they're going to be doing is basically relying on citizens reporting infractions. So regular people calling up OSHA and saying, hey, my company's not doing the mandates, or I know of a company that's not doing mandates. And then OSHA will be doing these spot checks. Okay. Well, any information, anything in the regs about Medical, religious exemptions, um, uh, you know, and, and then I've got to ask, how is this testing going to work? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the, when it comes to the exemptions, there are very clear guidelines for employers about what you can and cannot do when it comes to accepting or rejecting an employee's request for an exemption. For example, if a person is uh, saying they have a religious belief that 
causes them not to be able to get, get a vaccine. Uh, an employer is not allowed to question the validity of that belief, but they are allowed to question whether that employee sincerely holds that belief. So, for example, if an employee says, I object to um, drugs on a religious basis uh, that have used fetal cell lines in their testing, which Pfizer and Moderna have, then an employer can say, do you also object to other drugs? Do you use other drugs that have also been tested on fetal cell lines, such as the 30 other drugs, including over-the-counter drugs like Tylenol, Motrin, Benadryl, prescription drugs like Zoloft, z pack Lipitor, and other vaccines like rabies, uh, chickenpox, and uh, shingles vaccines. In fact, in Arkansas, some employees were given a religious uh, exemption, but they had to sign a form saying they don't use these 30-plus other drugs that also are tested on fetal cell lines. Okay. Well, that's... Um... Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be really hard uh, hard to get it. Tell us about the testing piece of it. If you're not vaccinated, how often do you have to be tested? What are the tests that are being mandate, mandated? How invasive are they? Uh, what's the testing piece? Well, the tests uh, have to be done once a week. And so if employees choose not to get vaccinated, they have to show a negative test once a week. And the most interesting part about this is that the employee has to pay for the tests. And also people who decide to not have the vaccine and go the testing route, they have to be vaccinated. And so for, I'm sorry, not vaccinated, they have to wear a mask. For employees uh, who do choose to get vaccinated, the companies have to pay for time off for the employee to get vaccinated and also pay for time off if the employee doesn't feel so well after getting vaccinated. And that goes into effect December 5th because these people have to be fully vaccinated vaccinated by January 4th. Okay. What about the state laws that are now on the books banning vaccine mandates? Are, are, are they effective or does federal law uh, overrule them? Well, the attorney for the Labor Department said that the, this new OSHA rule supersedes, this is a federal law, and it, they, he said that it supersedes any other state laws that ban vaccine mandates. So a lot of this is going to come out in court, Gordon. We know that there are, are a number of legal challenges to this new rule. Okay, well, let's talk hope, hope here. Uh, Pfizer says it has an experimental COVID pill that cuts hospitalization, cuts death by 90%. What can you tell us about the new treatment? Well, these are fantastic. These are antiviral pills. So if you feel bad, you can go to the doctor and they will give you these pills that you can take uh, twice a day for five days. And it uh, cuts the risk of hospitalization and death by 89 percent. So the FDA is obviously looking at this information right now. And these could this Pfizer drug could be approved as early as January. And there's another drug that's very similar, also an antiviral pill by Merck that the FDA is looking at. And they say that it reduces hospitalization and death by 50%. So folks can kind of compare these. These are two uh, COVID-19, what Tamiflu and Relenza and two other antiviral pills are to the flu. Very effective, very exciting. All right. Well, Laurie, thanks for that good news and thanks for the report. Uh, if you want something to really help you go to sleep at night, I highly recommend reading the OSHA regulations that the government just put out. But you'll notice, as long as you're staying awake through the first part, they spend page after page after page justifying the action and justifying how it's an emergency action uh, to stop a pandemic. Uh, they really are trying to bootstrap them, themselves into a position of authority, saying our mandate from Congress is to maintain safe working environments and we're in an emergency situation and we can't wait for Congress to act. We have to create these regulations on our own based on the president's mandate. So uh, if, if you want to go to sleep, it, it's a wonderful way to put yourself to sleep. At the same time, if you run a business with over 100 people, get ready for a brand new day. Uh, and uh, if, if you get fi fined with a, uh, found within some kind of violation that you're not following it, you're not uh, making sure that unvaccinated people wear masks all the time. They can't take them off ever. 
Uh, you have to uh, ensure that those who claim vaccinated are, are truly vaccinated. And then for those who are unvaccinated, you have to make sure they're being tested. Uh, the law is quite specific. It's taking that cost of testing and putting it on the employee, not the employer. Um, but that, it, 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 for the employer, if you're not verifying it and you're not following up, you've got $14,000 in fines. That's the minimum fine for each violation. This is absolutely incredible. Um, and Terry said it earlier. It's like they're trying to make everybody in America mad. Well, not just mad. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, I'm going to say when I hear all of this, I go, wait a minute. Not only are you telling people that they have to do this, not only are you shutting down businesses, but you're now pitting American citizens against each other because I'm going to tell on you. I mean, you just got to look at it and go, what in the world is going on? Talk about the legal part of this, because if these states are going to come against some of this, when does that happen? Can well, it stop this? Well, the federal courts this? will always back the federal law. Uh, that, that ship sailed a long time ago, back in the 1930s, with the expansion of the Commerce Clause. And uh, under the Commerce Clause, Congress has broad ability to regulate interstate commerce. Every business in America is engaged in interstate commerce, and so there's no way you can... Uh, avoid the regulation. Uh, where it might have a weakness is, is this truly an emergency, you know, a year and a half, a uh, year in, in, into the pandemic, is it, is it still an emergency? And, you know, is the four month delay from the president announcing it to it being enforced, does that underscore emergency or, or count against it? Um, Can it stop it? My prediction is is the federal courts will enforce it, um, and and then we'll then we're into a whole new um, a whole new ball game. Uh, the good news is we got an election in a year, so uh, but in the same time that's a long way away, and this thing comes into effect on January four. Wow. In other news, President Biden's huge social spending and climate change bill is still facing opposition. The big issue: how much will it really cost? Efren Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Efren. Gordon, after failing to bring both the bipartisan infrastructure bill already passed by the Senate and the president's expensive Build Back Better plan to a vote Thursday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was ready to try for a vote again today. Even so, moderate Democrats still have several questions about the president's bill, including the cost, although supporters say it will come to one and three quarter trillion dollars over 10 years. An estimate from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School says the actual cost could be as high as nearly $4 trillion and potentially add more than $2 trillion to the national debt. Turning now to Israel, just north of the city of David, archaeologists believe they have found the first of its kind engraving on a precious gem. And as CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell tells us, the engraving is a biblical plant known to many as the Balm of Gilead. Deep underground in a 2,000-year-old drainage ditch next to Jerusalem's western wall, archaeologists say a rare artifact from Second Temple times was uncovered. It's a stone seal made of semi-precious amethyst stone with an engraving of a dove and a branch of a tree with fruit on it. And what was surprising was that it's a branch with fruits that are not recognized with other seals from that period. The seal would have been on a ring. It was found while archaeologists and volunteers were sifting the remains from the drainage ditch at the Emek Surim National Park operated by the City of David. Once we found the seal with the branch and the fruit, we hypothesized that it was the biblical persimmon fruit plant as mentioned in the Bible and in the sources of the Second Temple and the Byzantine periods. This biblical persimmon plant is not related to the orange persimmon fruit of today. It was known in ancient times by several names, Bosom, Balsam, and even the Balm of Gilead. Jerusalem's primary drainage channel was built under the pilgrimage road. The pilgrimage road started from the Shiloach pool in the city of David and went up to the temple of the second temple period. Apparently, this ring with the seal fell into the drainage ditch 2,000 years ago. For 1,000 years, ancient Hebrew farmers were the only ones in the world known to cultivate this exotic plant. 
using it for medicinal and cosmetic purposes. Guy Ehrlich has been working to revive that biblical agriculture. It is the only one in the country growing that biblical persimmon. That's why archaeologist Eli Shukran took the stone to Ehrlich's farm for him to see. It's just amazing. Someone took a branch of the balm of Gilead and drew it on the stone. It does not remind me of any other plant I know. Biblical and historical sources also say it was used during the Second Temple period as one of the more expensive ingredients for producing the temple incense. This is the same persimmon that is identified with the biblical persimmon. It is the persimmon that served as the first of the incense ingredients of the temple and as the anointing oil of the kings and priests. Ehrlich has 10,000 Baum of Gilead trees. He markets perfume and essential oil from the trees. He also grows frankincense. There is a wall-to-wall -wall agreement that this is the plant, but there is little graphic depiction of it. And what you have brought me now is really a greeting from history. I felt like someone wrote me a note with a drawing of the fruit of my persimmon plant and sent it to me. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I love that phrase, a greeting of history. Gordon? It's amazing how archaeology is proving the Bible. Literally every single week you're getting a new archaeology story coming out of Israel. Uh, that shows these amazing things. And if you've ever had an opportunity uh, to, to get some of these wonderful scents that are coming out of Israel today, whether it's frankincense or myrrh or spikenard, uh, and now the balm of Gilead, uh, I encourage you to do it. It'll, it'll take you on a sensory journey back to the Holy Land. Fights on. Well, that was the signal that Israel's most advanced aerial exercise was about to take off. Blue Flags 2021 is a multinational effort featuring top fighter jets from seven different countries. So what's the purpose of the show of unity and strength? One goal is to send a clear message to enemies in the Middle East. Chris Mitchell reports from Israel's Negev Desert. That's the sound of some of the world's most advanced fighter jets filling the skies over Israel. The Blue Flag 2021 exercise here in the Urbda base in the heart of the Negev Desert is Israel's largest, most advanced exercise. And as it says, they bring together side by side, wing to wing, the best air forces in the world. This allied force includes the U.S., Greece, Germany, India, France, Italy, and for the first time, the U.K. This is a great opportunity for Israel, again, to show how we do cooperation and why we do it. Seven different countries come to Israel, to this beautiful land, to train together and see how we can do things better. The challenge is merging different countries, aircraft, and tactics into one cohesive unit to fight a common enemy. This unidentified Israeli pilot flies the F-35. I mean, it's such different. Their air force are different than ours, and it's so nice to see how it Things are going in different places and different experiences and different feelings. But we learn a lot from that, both in the professional side and the personal side. It's a fantastic experience uh, learning uh, the different tactics and philosophies of how they like to operate the mission. And from there, especially me as a younger wingman, learning just see different other perspectives and experiences within the fighter community. In addition to personnel, a main goal is incorporating aircraft, such as bringing the latest F-35 Joint Strike Fighter alongside older F-15 and F-16s. Then, as the pilots take off over the Negev Desert, their motto becomes Fights On. Fights On is just a brevity term used to tell everyone, hey, we're about to start uh, tactically maneuvering, so prepare. Germany has joined the biannual exercise several times. That's key given the troubled history between the two countries. Over the last years, we've uh, developed really close relationships. Uh, it's the third time that we're participating in Blue Flag. Also last year, we had an Israeli squadron at our base uh, for a exchange. So for us, coming here now is uh, really a very special event. It's so special that we even uh, painted one of our typhoons uh, with special colors representing the German and the Israeli flag. While the camaraderie is important, Israeli officials are constantly reminded that they operate in the world's most dangerous airspace. A senior IDF official tells CBN News, over the past few years, Israeli warplanes have been fired upon more than a thousand times while attempting to stop the spread of Iranian influence on Israel's borders. This gathering also saw an historic development with the attendance of a special guest. 
The visit of the Air Force commander from the United Arab Emirates represents a quantum leap in cooperation between former Middle East enemies. It's a very significant visit. The Abraham Agreement opened a variety of, uh, let's say, opportunities in the region to collaboration and cooperation between uh, countries that we didn't flew with them for the last 75 years. It's a signal of stability and also a force uh, demonstration. That sends a clear message of deterrence to Iran and other enemies in the region. So we believe that the cooperation of different countries, both in the region and globally, that share the same interests and the same values can really promote the stability of the region. And by showing that we are here cooperating and are oriented to that goal, we believe can bring more stability to the region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Urfda Air Force Base, the Negev Desert. Well, this isn't just an idle exercise when you look at the airspace in the Middle East and specifically the airspace over northern Israel. You'll find Turkish jets, you'll find Russian jets, you'll find Syrian jets, and you'll find Iranian air defenses uh, all arrayed to uh, attack. And it's, it's serious stuff when you, when you hear someone from the Israeli Air Force talk about thousands of attacks against their aircraft in supposedly a time of peace, uh, you, you get the implication of, of where this is going. The show of force is, is specific, and there's one specific country in, in mind, and that's Iran. And as they are pursuing a nuclear weapon, uh, this I hope they're paying attention to this show of force, but I hope we're paying attention to it, that we understand just how important it is for them to never obtain a nuclear weapon. Lucas Allison had only contempt for God. His wife, Sierra, wanted nothing to do with Christians. So when Sierra started having a change of heart, Lucas thought there was only one explanation. She must have been brainwashed. I believed that there was a God, but I also believed that he wasn't good. I felt like how could an all-powerful, all-good being let so many bad things happen in my life. Lucas Allison was molested by a neighbor when he was a young boy. The resulting pain and confusion set the trajectory for his life. I don't think I really had any idea that it was wrong or that anything was off about it until I started getting older and then we started learning about those sorts of things in school. I was you know, angry about a lot of things. Um, I was starting to become, you know, depressed and sort of suicidal. One of the first experiences I had with like an attempted suicide was when I was um, probably 12 or 13 years old. His father had suffered a traumatic brain injury from a fall, which made it difficult to have a relationship with him. My dad was never really um, emotionally available after my, he and my mom divorced. My dad, um, he changed a lot. Lucas turned to drugs and alcohol at an early age, but sought friends in the world of heavy metal and goth music. I really resonated with a lot of the, you know, the, the darker themes and music that was really about um, pain and abandonment and things like that. So I didn't really have a lot of friends elsewhere, um, but we were all kind of like the outcasts together. Feeling disconnected from his family and unsure of a direction for his life, Lucas enlisted in the army and was stationed in Iraq. The first time that I had been in an IED attack, I just remember thinking to myself, like, if there is a God and he's doing this to me, then he's a jerk and I don't want any part of him. It's because I, I still believe in God, I just hated him. Lucas loved to debate Christians and mock their beliefs. I would just sit there and poke holes in you know, everything that I heard or anything that people were talking about, I felt really bad about myself and I wanted to kind of tear them down so that they, they felt as bad as I did. After his discharge, Lucas drifted for a while and had a brief failed marriage. Then he met Sierra, who was raised a Christian but had been wounded and judged by the church and had walked away. When I met Lucas, I didn't want anything to do with God or any of the people who claimed to love God, I wanted to be as far away from God and his so-called people in my mind at that point um, as I possibly could. And Lucas seemed to tick all the boxes. 
Sierra's mother had encouraged her to write a letter to her former pastor, who asked to meet with her. He wanted to meet with me. He wanted to hear my story. He wanted to um, encourage me and meet me where I was. Just the kindness of him um, being willing to meet me there was what turn, turned everything for me. It changed my heart. To Lucas' displeasure, Sierra began attending church again. Lucas decided to attend with her so he could monitor her. I was worried that uh, she was being brainwashed because I couldn't fathom in my head, like, how could she just, like, let them apologize to her and then all of a sudden she's a Christian again. And I'd be taking notes, just listening to everything that the pastor was saying and just trying to find inconsistencies and find reasons why uh, it wasn't good information and I couldn't. Um, attending church, you know, regularly and listening to the message and um, just reading a lot, um, you know, it, he really started to kind of soften my heart. A pastor at the church encouraged him to attend a three-day silent retreat, and Lucas reluctantly agreed. I did a lot of journaling while I was at the retreat. I would read for a little bit, and then maybe I would find a passage, and I would just kind of look at it. I would put down, like, all my thoughts as if I were having, like, a conversation with Jesus. And the more that I did that and the more that I journaled um, during that time, the more I just kind of had this overwhelming feeling of acceptance. Lucas came back from the retreat a different person. I had definitely said, okay, I'm ready to follow Jesus and I'm, I'm ready to you know, give my life to, to serving. I was given a very performance-based picture of God when I you know, realized that Jesus isn't like that. He doesn't ask us to perform for him. He just willingly gives us salvation and love and all we have to do is accept it. I started to be able to forgive my dad. I started to realize that really it wasn't even my dad's fault. So I was able to start looking deeper into my past and really addressing some of the things that, that were kind of unresolved. Lucas went on to get a teaching degree. Today, the Allisons have a family and are serving God faithfully at their church in Kentucky. When I think about how God used not only my hurt, when I see how God used that to reach my husband, the redemption of that, him healing, not just him, but he healed me. And it is just, it's amazing. I'm blessed to have such a huge ministry field. I can't actually share the gospel with my students, but that doesn't mean that I can't minister to them. That doesn't mean that I can't love them by example doesn't mean that I can't live my life in a Christ-centered way. Faith is difficult for a lot of people, but when you actually experience Jesus, then it just, it makes faith impossibly easy. Wouldn't you like it if your faith were impossibly easy, where you finally saw how God had been working all things together for your good? And he does that specifically for those who are called according to his purpose. In my life, I've seen one of the signs of the call, and that's somebody that wants to poke holes in it, that wants to argue with God, that wants to uh, engage in the debate and then uh, point out to Christians all the different places they have it wrong. That's always a sign that they're searching and they're looking. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. Now, here's the question, and it's a question that's as old as the book of Job. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen in church? Why do bad things happen in families? Uh, I think we all know why bad things happen in war. But to blame God for them, and then you're missing it. God didn't start the Iraq war. God didn't start the problem in your family, and he certainly didn't start the problems in the church. What he is is the answer to those problems, and he can actually use them. He can actually use them for his glory. He can turn them around. 
He can show you how he's able to weave all things together for your good. In my morning meditation today, I was thinking about some of the bad things that have happened to me and some of the bad things that I've done. And it, it was interesting. I got a mental picture of a baker and, and you're, you're making bread and you put in the yeast and then you hope the dough will rise and the dough rises and you know, I was, you, know you start thinking, I'm risen, it's great. What does the baker then do? Comes in and punches it down and then puts it in a really hot oven. So if you're wondering why, well, God's in the bread baking business and he wants those things. Untested faith is no faith at all. But when you step, step back from it and take that look, how is God weaving all this together for my good? Now you heard it from that wonderful family where the wife is saying, well, the bad things happened, and it's interesting how they happened so that Lucas could come to God. Isn't that amazing? She saw through it. She saw how God was able to, to make all things work together. For Lucas, all of his questioning comes into a sharp focus on a retreat, and he starts journaling. And suddenly the performance-based God that he had thought was real turned into the God who accepted him for who he was. There was nothing that Lucas had to do. There's no performance objective. God's not keeping a, a record of the number of things you've done wrong. He's not got some list that he's checking twice. No, he doesn't do that. What does he do? He loves you unconditionally. He accepts you just the way you are. Jesus, the friend of sinners, wants to come to you. Why? Because he loves you and he wants you to be with him for all eternity. That's his plan. That's his purpose. That's what he wants for you. Now, at the end of the retreat, at the end of the journaling, at the end of all the questions, what was revealed to Lucas? A God who loved him, a God who wanted him, a God who was able to redeem and set him free. And you heard him. Faith is now easy. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It's not the judgment. It's the goodness. And when you embrace that goodness, boy, salvation becomes so easy. Don't neglect it. Don't neglect this great salvation. God wants you, and he wants you for all eternity. If this is for you, if you want to really meet Jesus today, he's willing to come to you. All he's waiting for you to do is ask. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. You won't find the judging God, you'll find the loving God, the forgiving God, the one who wants to be with you. Let's pray, let's ask for that, and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, just say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you, and Lord, I want to know that you're real, I want to know that you love me, that you want to be with me, that you can forgive me, that you can cleanse me, that you can set me free. And Jesus, if you'll do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to see the plan that you have for me, how you've worked all things together for my good. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. We've made that easy for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call, I've got something for you. It's called A New Day. We can send you a, a link where you can download it, or you can go to the website, cbn.com slash a new day. 
Uh, we can send you a CD with a booklet of scripture verses. Anyway, I want you to have this. What it is is the teaching of what do Christians believe, how do you know that you're saved, and then how do you live the Christian life? All free, no financial obligation at all. If you want it, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The newest gospel artist is a computer program created using artificial intelligence. The digital artist is named JC, and the song is called Biblical Love. If you ever go to pieces, fall between the thunder clouds, I will put you back together. I won't let you down. Relevant Magazine reports some other countries experimented with digital artists for years, but this is the first gospel song believed to be written and recorded by an algorithm. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing clean water solutions around the world. The village of Karara in Nigeria had only three water sources, and all were unreliable or provided dirty water, so it was difficult for people to find water for drinking, cleaning, cooking, and farming. They also suffered from illnesses because of the water. Thanks to Operation Blessings Partners, water experts came up with a solution. A brand new deep water well was installed and tested to ensure it provides clean water. Operation Blessing also provided resources to keep the mosquitoes from breeding and spreading disease. The water system will bring fresh water to the heart of the village. An area team was also trained to maintain the well and given the tools to get the job done. And Operation Blessing staff also provided hand washing and hygiene training for the community. The chief and the community gave glory, honor, and praise to the Most High God for this great gift. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Two small cups of porridge. That's all a grandmother and her grandson had to eat. Then COVID hit their village and they were left with no food at all. So how did people like you come to their rescue? Take a look. Ever since her husband died, Grandma Dawn has been taking care of her grandson alone. My grandson and I have only each other. He is the apple of my eye, and I love him with all my heart. Grandma worked hard cleaning houses and as a caregiver for an elderly neighbor. She earned about $100 a month doing both jobs. That's not always enough to buy food. One time we shared two cups of rice porridge. Grandma gave me half of her portion. She said she felt full, but I knew she had not eaten anything that day. I wanted her to eat more. I thought, why is life so hard for us? Two years ago, I started to attend an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. There, he enjoyed healthy meals, received help with school, and watched episodes of CBN's Superbook. I used to think that the world was created by Buddha and that the great Naga, a big snake, helps us live. But Superbook showed me that God created the world. He owns everything and gave us breath. At the end of the Superbook episode, I prayed to become a Christian. I believe in God and I trust Him. Then the COVID pandemic hit. I could not go to church and Grandma Don could not clean houses. Soon they ran out of food. That night, my grandson and I were so hungry. We drank two glasses of water. We cried together and I asked him, what are we going to do? I said, Grandma, I will pray. I prayed, Father God, please bless us and give us food to eat. The very next morning, Orphan's Promise came knocking on their door. We brought them a food pack with rice, eggs, fish, noodles, milk, and household cleaning supplies. I was so glad that Orphan's Promise brought us food. My grandma and I were not going to starve. God answered I's prayers. So I said, I, I will believe in your God. More recently, to help grandma earn extra money, Orphan's Promise gave her 30 hens to start a poultry and egg business. 
Jacob. Thank you for our chicken farm. No more starving for us. And thank you for Superbook. It led us to God. Yeah. I'm so happy that Grandma will be in heaven with me and Jesus. When I grow up, I want to teach the Bible to many children because Superbook changed my life. Thank you. How did I and Grandma Dawn find help in their need? Just because people, people just like you, care enough to make a difference. You see, that's what joining the 700 Club is all about. It's about stepping into a point of need in the lives of people, sometimes here at home and often around the world. Stepping right into that place and making a difference in every way, not just making a difference physically by offering food or education or whatever the need might be, but by always bringing the message of the love of God right into that place, right into their lack of understanding about it. And families are touched and saved because of that. Lives are touched and changed and saved because of your kindness and generosity. If you're a 700 Club member already, thank you because you will allow that to happen. You make that happen. If you're not a 700 Club member, you need to join. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you're joining with thousands of us who are out to change the world with the love of Jesus Christ. How do you join? You call our toll-free number. It's right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. We do have lots of club levels. I'm talking to you about a general membership, but there are other memberships as well. You can see the list there. If you're already a general 700 Club member, maybe you'd consider going up to 700 Club Gold. You can't imagine what a difference is when you climb up just one le level of membership. And so do something today to make a great difference, especially as we head into Thanksgiving. What a great time to do that. And when you do, we have a gift for you. This DVD is called The Nearness of Heaven, and I think you'll find it really inspiring. It's filled with stories of people who, for one reason or another, have found themselves dead, have gone to heaven, and then been resuscitated and come back to life, and they tell us what they saw there. It's really fascinating. We want you to have this. We think it'll be a blessing to you. But more importantly, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing you are touching and changing lives, not once in a while, but every single day. Call 1-800-700-7000. As the co-founder of Voice of the Martyrs, Sabina Wormbrand stood up for persecuted Christians. As a young woman living under Nazi and Soviet occupation, she was a persecuted Christian herself. Even under this brutal oppression, Sabina never renounced her faith. And now a new film about her life reveals how she found victory through the suffering. CBN's Tom Beering interviewed director John Gruders to talk about Sabina's inspiring story. I think Sabina is just flat out one of the most important and influential women of the 20th century. Sabina Wormbrand exchanged injustice and resentment for a thriving life of forgiveness. John Gruder's upcoming film, Sabina, Tortured for Christ, The Nazi Years, is the prequel to his earlier movie about Richard Wormbrand, whom she marries. She was at Sorbonne University. She's studying physics. She is talented and smart. At the same time, what God does with her is bring about greatness through humility. She is a strong, strong woman in, in her own right in many, many ways, and Richard is the beneficiary of her strength. What surprised you in what you learned? Well, you're not gonna find a bigger story arc than the Sabina Oster that you'll meet in this movie, Sabina, to the Sabina Wormbrand. She started like all of us, uh, selfish. <laughs> They're atheists. They're hedonists. In fact, Sabina is militantly opposed to Christianity in any form. From a Jewish family in Romania, Sabina eventually joins Richard in discovering a faith that brought purpose to both of their imprisonments and their underground ministry during communist occupation. What is it about her enduring circumstances that stands out the most? Richard comes to Christ first. He explores the gospel and he comes to the conclusion a universe with no creator just can't compare to the thought of a God who speaks and listens. But she's not ready for that. So Richard shares his journey with her even to the point where he says, I'm gonna be baptized today. A huge step for him. That same day, she takes a blade and contemplates suicide so that when he comes home, he'll find her lifeless body and that'll show him. 
And she says, then I had a thought. What if he's right? Sabina's parents, two sisters, brother, and uncles later become victims to Nazi concentration camps. What will resonate about her life? We would benefit from meeting anybody who was able to face the enemy with love. She even meets the specific executioner that murdered her entire family and got away with it. Part of the gospel is forgiveness. Christ forgive me. He can forgive you. She chooses to fight back with love and forgiveness. She says, I, I couldn't do these things, but Christ in me can do all things. There was victory in Christ through the suffering. We're living in a lot of uncertainty right now. It tends to bring a lot of honesty. Yeah. Are we short on that in our Western world? This isn't in the movie, but they prayed that God would give them a cross to bear, recognizing that if Christ says, if you share in my sufferings, you'll share when I rise. And man, did they get one. <laughs> I mean, it came and it came heavy as they were brutally treated in prison and yet they continued to pray for their jailers. And it's very inspiring. I started to say, who are these people, right? What spoke to you personally? Sabine and Richard, in this movie, there's a moment, they're driving in their car, they're approaching a checkpoint and all of a sudden they realize these are Nazis and they're checking passports. He says, I'll be thrown into prison, I'll be tortured, it'll be the end of our life together. She opens her Bible, and she reads, whoever would save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. And she turns to him and she says, we believe this or we don't. And they drive straight into that checkpoint. In their story, here, we're still talking about them here in 2021 because they didn't run away and didn't try to preserve their life. They, they lost it for the sake of Christ. So John, the margin between one's reality of persecution and torture and another's view of it sitting comfortably in a soft theater yeah. seat. Yeah. Is that margin narrowing with greater empathy? Tom, that's a great question. I think about it a lot. There was a real cost that they paid that up till now, my wife and I have not paid. We have been spared the kind of persecution, but our brothers and sisters- If you want to see this movie, I encourage you to do it. Get tickets, find theater locations, going to CBN.com. We leave you today, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you.